Good afternoon and welcome. We're so glad you can join us today for a virtual field trip um, to the Gnangdengen site, um, where we are going to uh, walk through the production of and um, how white corn is processed um, with our friends from the Seneca Nation. Um, we are so excited you're able to join us this afternoon. So Ganang, the site at Ganangdagan is in Victor, New York, which is in Ontario County, just south of Lake Ontario. You can see here kind of halfway to western New York, halfway to central New York, halfway to the southern tier. Uh, we have Victor, New York, and we're so excited to be on site to learn about the White Corn Project. So we have our host today, um, Angel Jimerson. Angel, good afternoon. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do at the White Corn Project? Yeah, so uh, my name is Angel Jimerson. I'm Seneca Herring Clan, and I am the production manager here at Economic and White Corn Project. And as we start to go through our virtual field trip, if you have any questions for Angel, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll definitely relay those and try to get as many answered. So Angel, can you tell us a little bit uh, about the White Corn Project, the history, as well as the site that you're at now? Yeah, so um, the White Corn Project started in about mid to late 80s by a man named John Mohawk. He did a lot of research on um, the numbers of diabetes within our uh, indigenous communities. And that led him to really researching the effects of incorporating more of our traditional foods back into our diets. And that's why he started the project. Uh, processing corn takes a very long time. It's very labor intensive, it's very hands-on. Therefore, a lot of people had actually stopped processing corn and um, so he uh, went out to figure out an easier way to process it, um, process it, process it in bulk so that he can sell it to people and all they have to do is rehydrate it and have it on their tables. So it's, uh, it's a lot easier for other people to really incorporate it into their diets. Um, about 2006, John Mohawk had passed away and a couple years later, so did his wife. And his family did not have the space or the time to really take up the project. So it, it sat for a few years. And then in 2012, um, the site manager at the time of Ginondian had, who was John Mohawk's cousin, had taken up the project and brought it to Ginondian. And this was really significant because in 1687, a French army had um, planned to invade the Seneca people that were living here. And when they had caught word of that, they had burned down their houses, burned down their crops, um, so that the French army couldn't really take anything. And, and they fled um, to a neighboring uh, nation. And so when the French army came, saw that everything was already burned down, uh, Marquis de Denango was very upset by this, but ended up finding about a mile down the hill, there, were, um, there was a corn storage, um, a corn shed filled with 500,000 bushels of corn. And that was to follow um, you know, our, our practice of preparing for the next seven generations in the next seven years. So it was kind of an emergency um, source of food. And when he found this, uh, these bushels, he burned all of it. 500,000 bushels of corn uh, was burned by this French army. And so it was a, it was a big deal to be having um, this, this same corn actually coming back to this land. And it really showed the resilience of our people and of our seeds and our culture. So uh, we are here at, um, located in Victor, New York. 
we are on the land of Ganondigan State Historic Site, which is the site of a 17th century Seneca village. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's just a fascinating history, and I, I love how you're reviving the tradition. So how were, were the original seeds sourced for white corn? Were, was it something that um, there was a lot of research and a lot of looking for these seeds? How did they go about reviving the white corn? Yeah, so um, actually it never really died out um, due to residential schools uh, really shaming our languages and our culture and our songs, our teachings. Um, a lot of people took these things and went into hiding and now are, are starting to resurface. So they pass them down to their children and their children's children and to carry on these traditions. And now that we have that freedom to, um, to be practicing our culture again and to be speaking our language, uh, now everyone is sharing those things that were hidden in their family. So um, like in my family, my great grandfather, um, he, was, he was the farmer, uh, one of the main farmers of my reservation. And so he's the one who continued the, uh, that knowledge of processing corn and growing corn. And so that's something that ran in my family. And now I'm here teaching other people, sharing this knowledge now that we have the freedom to do that and the safety. Must really make connections for you to, to the past. Mm, yeah, for sure. I, uh, I have a great question for Ms. Chanel's class and she would like to know, um, if you only grow white corn or how do you source white corn? Is it something that you grow on site saying that it was once grown there at one time or um, is it sourced from somewhere else? Yeah, so um, we used to grow corn here on this land, but you know the, the process is a very long labor intensive process and it was just too much for our small facility to handle both. So we decided to focus on processing and um, we started to encourage indigenous farmers to start growing the white corn again. And um, so the past few years, uh, indigenous farmers have been popping up with learning how to uh, grow the corn again. And now we source from those, those indigenous farmers. So we're, um, we're, we're teaching our communities again and we're really connecting back together with the people of our communities. Um, so as we're thinking about uh, sourcing white corn, can you show us as it comes in, um, how it comes in? Uh, what do you do with the white corn? Does it come on trucks? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, we get, um, we have a lot of people who travel back and forth between uh, different reservations me being one of them so when we need corn and uh i'll pick up some corn and bring it back when it comes to uh whole cobs they'll they'll usually deliver it in big trucks but this is usually how we get our corn already shelled um this is a raw corn before it's processed and with this, when we get it like this in bushel bags, we have to sort it out, sort out any mold or any um, bruises or scratches that will potentially become mold. Uh, but once a year in about October, we will get a truckload full of cobs um, that were just harvested. And so we have a husking bee which will take uh, most of the husks off of the cob, and then we'll have three strong ones still on there. And I'll show you what we turn that into. We will then take the husks and start braiding them together into each other, and it creates this long braid. And this allows us to hang it up just like this, and we're able to let it sit 
so it can dry because the corn does need to sit and dry before it can be processed. Um, we, we hang it up to dry in October and then it's ready to be processed usually about March. And so is that all done by hand? You probably don't have machines that can do that, do you? No, it's all by hand and it's a, it's a community project. Um, when it comes to harvesting time, uh, most of the nations throughout the Confederacy have some sort of facility or some sort of space that they're growing corn and need help. So a lot of people will actually travel from one end of the Confederacy to the other and just for like a week straight, just braiding corn. And uh, it's, it's really a beautiful time to spend with each other. And, and when you're braiding corn, you're sitting next to other people and having conversations and getting to know sometimes new people, sometimes getting to spend time with someone you don't get to see as often. So it's, it's a really beautiful time of the year. Um, and traditionally, history is shared orally. Is that a chance for oral history to be shared as well? Yes. Uh, I mean, with all sorts of conversations going on, uh, a lot of communication, a lot of stories are exchanged. And um, some people are learning about corn. It's their first time learning about corn. Um, some people bring their own different knowledge about like basket weaving or um, cooking, baking, sharing recipes, all sorts of information is shared through that. So if I'm not part of the Confederacy um, or one of the nations, is, is there an opportunity for maybe my classroom or as an educator for me to participate? Yes. So actually here at Ganondigan, it's, it's all about participation. Um, uh, we have a lot of Native and non-Native people who come help with the husking bee. And it's, it's really enjoyable to be able to share uh, this way of life and this way of thinking with um, people who don't quite have the opportunity. So once the corn has dried over the winter, how long does it take for it to be ready to be um, processed to the next stage? Uh, yeah, so it goes in in October and then it's dry and ready to process about March. And when, when it's dry in March, is there another time that y'all get together to harvest the cobs and har harvest the corn or is there a machine that does that? Uh, yeah, so we don't use machinery. I understand that some of the farmers do, um, but the, the white corn has this really hard hull on it. And if it's, um, if the machinery gets it just right. It doesn't just crack a little bit. It doesn't just um, chip a little bit off. The entire kernel actually just breaks apart. And having those small pieces can really gum up the machinery, uh, like our grinder and um, any anything before it's processed. So we prefer not to use the machinery. Um, because it's, there's a lot of waste uh, that's produced from machinery. So here we do it by hand and we do have shelling bees, but we do have volunteers that come in every week. And since the corn is dry and it's shelf stable, it can sit for years. Um, so if, if you have plenty, you can spend years shelling just one yield. So, and then, but yes, we, we do that by hand. That's also an opportunity for um, people to engage with the White Corn Project, correct? Yes. So I have a great question about white corn. How is it different than other types of corn? Is it always white or white-ish? Yes. Uh, it is always white. Um, although with uh, like some crossbreeding, once in a while we will find unique kernels. Uh, my little crew here likes to collect the unique kernels. 
So we have sorts of different colors in here. We have blues, purples, pink, yellow corn. Sometimes we get these kernels that actually look like sweet corn, uh, which is always really interesting to find. Yeah, so it's, it's most of the time. These are the kernels we have collected in the past probably five years. So it's, it's not a whole lot, but it's always fun running into the purples and the reds. Um, but the difference between uh, what makes it so unique is the, um, the nutritional value of it. It has a low glycemic index, it's non-GMO, and it's gluten-free. So being gluten-free, we do have a flour product, and that, that gives it a different texture. It's very unique to work with. Uh, it's just like any other gluten-free flour. Uh, it's a little trickier to work with. Um, and then it's, it's non-GMO. So actually here we work a lot on protecting the seeds. So we don't actually share seeds outside of our community because of the fear of it being patented and stolen from us. So, um, and, and we, we cannot have it genetically modified. Um, so it's non-GMO. And having a low glycemic index means it has very low uh, glucose content. It doesn't contain a lot of sugar and it, it doesn't turn into sugar when, when your body's digesting it. So, and it has a whole bunch of nutrients uh, in, in one tiny little kernel. So it, it's really, um, it has a very high nutritional value. I always explain that with, uh, with the corn, it's, it's a slow processing food. And I like to explain it as you can have a two, two products, two types of food that have the exact same nutritional value, um, all of the same minerals and vitamins in it. And one could be a slow processing food and one could be a fast processing food. Now, when you have a fast processing food, it's going through your body so quickly that your body doesn't have that time to absorb all of the nutrients that it has to offer. Whereas a slow processing food, it stays, um, it stays in your body so much longer and it, it makes you feel fuller for longer uh, with just a little bit of food. And your body has so much time to absorb all of the nutrients that it has to offer. So the, the white corn is the slow processing food. I have a great question from Mrs. Burns' fifth grade class. Do you ever pop white corn or can it be popped? White corn cannot, but there is there are um, traditional, uh, like some of our original seeds that are pop corn. But in this particular corn, no, you cannot. <laughs> So as we're looking um, at the processing the steps of processing, you've seen it um, hung, dried, uh, you removed it from the cob. Uh, you talked about an outer shell. How do you remove that outer shell? And can you yeah, show so gonna, those steps? Yeah, I'm gonna move you into the kitchen to show you our little facility here. Our facility takes place in two different rooms. The room I was just in, which at that table is where we start the process with sorting. Um, and we actually end the process there too with uh, sorting it again and then packaging it after it's processed. In here is where we do the actual, most of the processing. We have an industrial stove. Uh, so the, the corn, like I said, has a very hard hull on it and the human body can't digest that hull. So it needs to be removed. And the way we do that is boiling it in, um, in a solution. So here we use the culinary line. Traditionally, what was used was hardwood ashes. And I understand that uh, some of you have hardwood ashes in your little, um, your little box there. Uh, so the, the difference between the two is Hardwood ashes would soften the hull. And from there, we would use these, our traditional corn washing baskets that have this texture 
this hard, rough texture on the side. And you would have to take a handful and scrub on the side of the basket uh, to manually remove each and every hull. And one handful could take up to 30 minutes to an hour to remove all the hulls. It's, it's a lot of work. Whereas today we're using a culinary lime and that dissolves the hull right off. But it's such a harsh chemical, it raises the pH level. Uh, so we have to make sure it's rinsed off enough that we, we take off all the culinary lime to bring the pH level back to uh, a good level for human consumption. And today that's what we're using these corn washing baskets for, more of a strainer rather than a scrubber. Um, so that's, we have this nice big sink here that will fill with water and then we'll just put the corn in the basket and rinse the, rinse the corn, put the basket in the water. Um, and that's, that's how we're getting that culinary lime off. And after that has to be tested, the pH level has to be tested. And then we will come to this table here and take handfuls of corn and spread them along these trays. These trays will then go into the dehydrator at 160 degrees for up to 20 hours. So the whole um, removing the hull and rinsing the corn takes uh, five to seven hours to do and then 20 hours for the drying, the dehydrating of it, uh, it's to do about 40 pounds is an entire day. So it, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of patience. And, but we have, we have three different products. So two of our products actually go through this, this process on the stove and having to be rinsed and dehydrated. One of the products actually does it and I'm gonna show you how we do that. So in this room, we have a commercial coffee roaster. And this, uh, it's been converted so it doesn't burn the corn completely, but it does burn that hull off. <clears throat> the roasted corn flour and the other two products because it, it gives it a nuttier smell and flavor to it. So it, it completely changes the, the experience, uh, but it, you can still use it the same as you would white corn flour. And then both, for both flours, we put it through a stone mill. We use a stone mill because metal blades actually affect the way flour tastes. And we wanna really preserve that natural flavor. So we have a stone mill grinder. And yeah, that's how we do the white corn flour and the roasted corn flour. So I have a great question from Mrs. Bailey, second grade class. Um, as you talked about creating the flowers um, for those classrooms that received an inquiry box, um, some of the students are noticing a powder that smells like peanut butter or popcorn. What is that? Yes, so that is the roasted corn flour. Um, that is that different. Uh, and, and you can tell by the, the look of it, it has a different color than the white corn flour as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the difference with roasting. And the roasting of it, we don't have to put it through the culinary lime solution. So it's, it's our easiest way of processing and having that, that smelling like peanut butter or popcorn is, um, it's, is kind of our popular item because <laughs> it's so different. But I've noticed uh, when I was doing a lot of outreaches and setting up a table to try to get people uh, to learn about the corn, we would have samples of each product and we would allow people to smell the flowers and smell the differences. And I noticed a lot of younger people, mainly kids would smell peanut butter when they smell the roasted corn. And a lot of adults would smell popcorn. And that, I always think that's interesting because when I was younger, I always smelled peanut butter and now I'm getting older, I'm starting to smell popcorn. So it's, it's a fascinating product. Um, so I have a lot of questions um, 
again, Mrs. Burns, fifth grade class um, about the culinary uses of corn. Um, Jimmy wants to know, is the corn gold? Is the white corn project? I think we saw a little, a few gold flakes, but can you tell us a little bit about that? A few, what was that? We saw a few of the flakes were goldish, but it looked like most of them are white. Um, like the corn kernels? The color of the corn? The raw, yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, a, it's a lot like a golden white-ish. Um, there are these ones that have this like pinkish, oh, where'd it go? pinkish tint to it and that makes it look like a gold or brown but there are it said that uh, I remember hearing this uh, a few years ago um, we had some people come visit and help with the husking bee people have been around for a while actually explained to us that the white corn is not its original form it's actually uh, from a different, like different varieties of corn mixed together that created the white corn. One of those varieties being the Seneca pink corn. So a lot of times when there's that discoloring and it's starting to look pink, it's said that that's the corn trying to go back to its roots and that it should be planted. Um, so yeah, there there is some discoloring and it's it's always interesting to see the, the different colors that it can have despite being white corn. And could you tell us a little bit about the different culinary uses of white corn? Oh, yes. So we have uh, hulled corn and then we have the two flowers. So the two flowers, very similar. Uh, you would use them in the same way you would any gluten-free flour. Uh, so mainly gluten-free baking. You can do like a one-to-one -one ratio of all-purpose flour. Uh, my aunt does that a lot. And yeah, there, there's so many different things you can do with the flour. People do pancakes, muffins, cookies. Um, my favorite is to do porridge. And for the hull, you would rehydrate it like you would dried beans or hominy. And you can use it for soups and stews, salads, chilies. Um, I like to eat the rehydrated corn just as is, just by itself. Um, I also like eating the dried corn by itself after it's processed. Uh, it makes for a good snack. But yeah, those are, we have a ton of recipes on the getonagain.org website. And there's a cookbook, uh, I think at the gift shop. So there, there are, there have been many people come in and out of this project who have experienced or um, experimented with different recipes. And so a lot of them ended up on the website. So I have a great question from Mrs. Lewis class. Parker wants to know, does it taste different than other corn varieties? Yes, it does. Um, it's really hard to describe. Uh, it's, it's not really like anything else, but it doesn't really have a strong flavor like sweet corn would. Um, it's, it's a very distinct flavor. And Mrs. Shell's fourth grade class would like to know how long does corn keep? You do it right, it can keep forever. Um, I know uh, it, it can it can keep for years and years and years, but the issue is the bugs really like it. So before before it spoils and starts rotting, the bugs are gonna get to it first. So And from Mrs. E's class, they want to know what is the tastiest, I guess we'd have to define tastiest thing to cook with white corn. So could you give us a savory and a sweet recipe or dish? Mm. Well, like I said, the corn does have a low glycemic index. 
So, I mean, the sweetest you're gonna get is however much sugar you add. <laughs> but uh, I think the sweetest would be pancakes. Um, especially if you're using the roasted corn, it, it just has a sweet, nutty flavor to it. And, um, but there's also, you know, it's coming up on holidays. A lot of people will have holiday cookies and a lot of um, holiday parties will, will have sugar cookies. And it, it's hard to stop eating those cookies, but I find that um, making, we have a recipe, a few different cookie recipes on the website. And I think my favorite is the lemon zest one. And it, it makes for a really good holiday cookie because you don't have to stop yourself from eating them. Um, they're, not, they're not super sugary, but they're still kind of sweet. And uh, it, it won't make you sick. It just, it, it's really good and nutritious. Um, so that, that would be my suggestions for sweet. Savory, I'm not too sure. I'm not much of a cook. Um, I, I'm more involved with baking my own stuff. And even then I stick to the same four recipes. So, but I think I would say soups. Any, it's really good in any soup, any chili. Um, I think one of my favorites is a uh, butternut squash soup that my aunt makes. That sounds absolutely delicious. And Trevor from Mrs. Shell's class wants to know, can you substitute it for regular flour? Uh, can you make the same type of foods? Yes. Um, yes, you can. But there are some changes that have to be made because it doesn't have gluten. Now, gluten is the sticking agent for, for baking. And um, regular flour has that gluten. But gluten-free flour... Uh, you know, whatever you're baking is most likely going to crumble and fall apart. So you need to have that sticking agent. And there are different types of substitutes for gluten. Uh, so you just have to keep that in mind when you're using a gluten-free flour. So I have a lot of questions. Um, one from Emily Shoup, who wants to know your job in the process. But it, this goes along uh, the line of other questions we have. How did you get engaged with the White Corn Project and how long have you been here? So I have been here for 10 and a half years. Um, when I was 13, uh, 12 or 13, I had gotten into a little bit of trouble at school and uh, had to take a break from schooling. And within that time, um, my aunt dragged me down here to this facility to work alongside my brother's father to paint the walls and um, remodel this old farmhouse because this project was gonna be moving in, so it needed to be ready. And so after putting all that work into this house and really fixing it up, I decided to try out working for the White Corn Project and I've been here ever since. I love that story. Um, and I, no I noticed through this process and as you're sharing the process of white corn, it's done by hand. It sounds like there's a lot of community involvement. So can you just talk about as a person going through the process every year, what does that mean to you? Uh, having been doing this for a very long time, um, you know, as I've explained, it takes a long time to really see the end result uh, from start to finish. There's a lot of work involved, a lot of hands-on work, and it we're, we're told so many stories growing up uh, as indigenous children, uh, these different stories of 
you know, teaching us how we're supposed to be grateful and mindful. And we're told that the natural world are our original teachers. So when we're out there in the woods or working with our foods, um, that's when we really learn the things we need to learn to be human. And so that's, that's why they say the corn has a hard hull that you have to remove because working with it to, to get something you can eat, uh, just sticking with that process helps you to slow down. It teaches you patience. And at the end, when you have, when you put in so much work to have a bowl full of corn, you become very grateful for that food that you have. And uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, about, you know, the maple syrup, because the maple syrup also has uh, a long process to it. And, you know, you can have a bucket of sap, uh, maple water, boil it down, and you only get a little bit of syrup. And um, so I, I remember growing up hearing the story about, they would say the creator would, uh, had created these trees that this, this syrup would just flow out of. And after he had created them, little by little, he noticed the, he would look down and see the people were not taking care of their jobs, they, they weren't taking care of their responsibilities, they weren't taking care of the kids or the crops. And he would always find them laying under, no, under those trees, letting the syrup flow into their mouths as, as they got chubby and they, um, they were just forgetting all of the things that they had to do and they became greedy. And so after seeing that too many times and then, one day um, the children were playing and got hurt and no one was around to take care of them. He, he got after the people and he had actually taken away the syrup and remade it and gave it a process so that you have to, um, you have to go through this process in order to have this sweet maple syrup. Um, so you have to put in the work that's gonna, that's gonna continue um to keep you grateful for that i absolutely love that and i believe we can apply that as adults and students um in our lives and as a maple producer i i can directly relate <laughs> um with the process and the pride that you have when you create a great product um so speaking of products we have a, a question if any of our educators want to purchase any of the flower from you, I know we sent it to some of our classrooms. How can they find um, white corn products? Yeah, so right now it's a little tricky. Um, the last two growing seasons have actually, there have been a drought. Um, so it, it's been hard to get a hold of the raw corn. And so, yeah, right now we are only processing for orders. We aren't keeping a stock of processed corn. Although our gift shop at the cultural center, um, I think that's the only place we usually keep stock and that's for events. Um, so that, that the gift shop up there uh, see where they're at, because um, if you contact us, we're we're not going to have anything. So, and awesome. this, this might be on for another two years or so. I think we'll start to catch up in 2024, but it also depends on next year's growing season as well. And y'all are part of the Seneca um, historic. Um, area there in Victor. Um, so it's just not the White Corn Project, but there's the Seneca Art Facility and a Longhouse, correct? Yeah, so we have um, the Seneca Art and Culture Center is uh, is getting on again. It's a state historic site. Um, they do have a replicated Longhouse. It's closed for the season. Uh, I want to say it opens back up in March or April when it starts to warm up. 
but uh, in the meantime, they do have in, in the cultural center, they have an amazing um, uh, museum they can go through and they have the longhouse replicas that are a lot smaller, but you can at least see what it'll look like inside. And then when it warms up, you can actually go into the full size longhouse and get to stand in there and experience what it, what it smells like, what it looks like, what it feels like. So um, yes, and we are connected with the friends of Ganon again. That's how we're all, we're all kind of one, we're all one, um, we're all Ganon again, just different parts of it. And when you say full size longhouse, it is a full size tall long house. Yes. So yeah. it, it is, you will experience the whole experience, correct? Yes. So I have a great last question for you from Mrs. Shell's class. And she wants to know that when y'all gather to do your community work, is there any uh, address that you give for Thanksgiving as far as thanking the community and thanking each other? Would you be willing to share that with us? Um, yes, yeah, so there, there is generally when we start, uh, when the community comes together, whether we're eating, whether we're working, uh, before we start anything, there is a Thanksgiving address that's given, and it just talks, it, it's a reminder of that gratitude. And it's, it's a very long Thanksgiving address. I want to say it takes about five to eight minutes to recite, but that's because it goes through starting off with each individual person saying, I'm, I'm very grateful that you were able to make it here safely. And uh, we address every single person. Then it goes on to is expressing um, the thanks for the natural world. And that's what takes forever because there are a lot of things in the natural world that really take care of us that we rely so heavily on that maybe we don't even realize. And that's, that's our constant reminder to, um, to, to be grateful for it. And that's the moon, the sun, the birds, the animals, the water, the plants, the wind, the, the seasons, the, um, the snow, the rain, every single thing is, uh, is brought up in this Thanksgiving address that we give. Well, thank you so much, Angel. What an awesome experience. Um, and thank you for sharing your project and the White Coin Project with us um, and giving us an insight to this process and the history. There's so many great questions we were unable to get to, but we do want to thank you um, and the Friends of Ganondagan um, and Seneca Tribe um, Nation for your time and working with us. Um, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and all of our teachers and students out there. We'll send a follow-up uh, email with this information in it so that if you want to learn more about Angel, the White Corn Project, Friends of Ganondagan, and the Seneca Arts Facility um, and Long Longhouse, which is really cool, um, you'll be able to get that information. So thank you so much, Angel, and you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. You too.